Hi, welcome to The Jenna Bank Show. I'm Jenna, your host, and I am all about helping you live life to your fullest potential. My guest today is Brianna Bully. She's a women's trauma coach, a speaker, explorer, and a lover of life. And we're going to dig deep into what it takes to live fully expressed as yourself, as your authentic self today. Now, her entire methodology is built upon the belief that we are all put on this earth for a unique purpose and with a unique message. Having worked in the coaching industry for almost a decade, Brianna has had the pleasure of working with, for, and alongside some of the greatest minds and individuals in their chosen fields, from world champion athletes to human behavioral experts to leading entrepreneurs and everything in between. Brianna's work is now in empowering women to heal through trauma, abuse, and struggle to create the life of their wildest dreams, from surviving to thriving, and to use their pain as a springboard to inspire and impact those around them. And welcome, Brianna. Thank you so much for being here today. It really is a pleasure having you. No, thank you. I'm excited. So tell me a little bit more. Now you're based in uh, New Zealand, right? Uh, Australia, Gold Coast, Australia. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. My head was thinking New Zealand and I knew it was. That. Okay, so never good. mind. Scratch that. So it's nice and early in the morning over there for you. Um, and for me, it's late in the day. So obviously you can tell I haven't had a glass of wine yet. So that is not my excuse. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I'm really kind of excited to dive into this topic with you because, you know, I'm all about living our best selves. And um, I didn't even, I wouldn't have even been able to really understand about how to have this conversation with you until I myself uncovered some trauma that had been holding me back from living my best life. So uh, as I understand, you are a coach that, that pretty much this is what you specialize in, right? Yes. Yeah. And so how would you explain it? Maybe you explain to all of us what your specialty is in the coaching arena. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I'm a trauma coach for high performing women. And essentially what I support women in doing is that there, there's sort of two elements of it. The first is looking at um, what kind of the background noise is, the, the, the trauma playing out behind the scenes that keeps them stuck in these limiting patterns. These, um, you know, I, I often see women who are very driven, but they're driven from an unconscious pain. They're driven from almost trying to outrun that thing that happened to them. And that thing could be anything from, you know, I call them capital T trauma or lowercase t trauma. Mm. And so it could be anything from, you know, what we traditionally think of as trauma or abuse or, um, you know, having experienced violence or, or anything along those lines, or your lowercase t traumas, which can be more of the you know, the day to day stuff, the more of, you know, something as simple as maybe you tripped over in the supermarket and someone saw and that brought up this feeling of shame or embarrassment, you know. And so it's it's supporting them in um, finding their identity beyond that so that they're not being driven by pain. And then from there, revealing what their true calling is, what their true, you know, soul's mission is in this lifetime so that they can, you know, start to up level their relationships, up level their finances, up level all facets of life. So do you find that the, um, the, this trauma then creates these limiting beliefs, which are holding them back? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of the work I do does focus on, you know, the cognitive side of things. So limiting beliefs and the way we, we think about the world and the way we think about ourselves. But even deeper than that, I, I go into the, the nervous system side of things. So looking oh. at how we actually uh, relate to the world uh, on a bodily level. So, you know, if, if something looking at a, a really primal way of navigating the world. So, you know, we think of animals when an animal is under threat, they either freeze, so mm -hmm. they play dead or they go into fight or flight. And so humans are no different. If we've had something threaten us in the past, we can almost get stuck in these cycles of that's how we respond to things. And so we hold ourselves back because maybe we're, we're unknowingly trapped in a freeze response. You know, and that could be due to something that happened when we were children that we don't even remember. Mm. 
and yet you know we're consistently holding ourselves back because we're we're stuck in this freeze response oh my gosh that makes so much sense mm. wait so can you give us an example maybe a case history of someone that had a situation that was holding them back that was co uh, tra caused by trauma but where they were behaving consistently in this fight or flight kind of response yeah absolutely so i'll use myself as an example and this was one that i and you know this is this is ever evolving work so it's you know we're never done and so for me i i only uncovered this about maybe three or four months ago uh, i realized that i was in uh a, a what, what's called a blended state so this is where there's it's like you're hitting the brake at the same time that you're hitting the accelerator mm -hmm. and this stemmed back for me from when i was 10 years old and at the time i loved to dance and sing and perform and so i would often um put myself in positions at school assemblies or school um performances where i'd be up on stage and that eventually made me the center point of bullying and so at 10 years old i went through a stage where i was uh quite depressed and i was i was sort of going through some behind the scenes kind of suicidal thoughts. And no one, you know, my parents didn't know, no one knew what was going on. It was something that I very much kept hidden. But what happened for me was that experience then had me believe that if I were to really succeed in life and really put myself in the spotlight, that that would result in me being bullied. And so unknowingly as an adult, it was like I was consistently trying to achieve all of these things so that was me with the foot on the accelerator. But on a deeper level, I had this deep belief within my body that if I were to succeed, that I would I would basically be bullied and that would then lead to that same feeling of depression and, and it's, you know, suicidal tendencies. And so I was hitting the brake at the same time. Mm. And so when I started to realise, oh, my God, for the last, I mean, I'm 28 now, so that's 18 years of basically unknowingly being in this uh, in this freeze response, in this, you know, th thing of not letting myself do the thing that I wanted to do, yeah. procrastinating and hesitating and, you know, putting it off and finding excuses because of this deep feeling of threat within the body. Oh, my gosh. That makes so much sense. Mm. Okay. So once you uncover this trauma, how, what kind of um, coaching do you use? What kind of techniques do you use to help your clients work this through? Because I would imagine it's just so deeply embedded in the unconscious subconscious that it would be hard to overcome because it's been part of you for so long. Mm, definitely. So I do it across three levels. So the deepest level is the nervous system. And so this is looking at what's called bottom up regulation. So when we think of how we process the world, only 20% of how we process the world is from the mind down to the body. So the body responding to our thoughts. It's actually 80% what our body takes on in a, uh, in a sensory sense, communicating with the brain. So if we have this... Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead, because I want to understand that a little bit more. I'm so yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, did you want me to dig deeper into that? That would be amazing, if you don't mind, because I'm yeah. trying to just... I'm trying to put myself in that situation because if it's 80%, I'm sure it's happening to me all the time and I'm not aware of it. So what yeah. would be some examples of that? Yeah. So, um, Ooh, I'll, I'll, I'll share. And I'm sure he'll be absolutely fine with me sharing this. I'll share an example that a friend of mine actually gave me. So he's a um, high level martial artist and, um, he was in a grand final, um, a grand final fight in a tournament the, a few weekends ago. And he was in a situation where he got uh, a cut on his eye. Mm -hmm. And so blood was basically streaming down his face. And in that moment, his brain said, it's fine. It's just a cut. We'll get it looked at after. But his body went straight into, oh, my God, I'm, I'm bleeding, like complete, you know, stress attack, right? right? And so even though his mind was communicating to the body, I'm safe, this isn't a big deal, it's just blood, no biggie, we're going to be okay, mm -hmm. his body was communicating, oh my God, I'm bleeding, you know, like I'm, I'm under threat here, what are we going to do? Right. Yeah, so it's it's 80% your, your senses and what your body determines as being a threat communicates to the brain and only 20% um, is the brain communicating 
to the body. So, okay. So his brain was saying, you're okay. You're okay. But it wasn't enough to overcome the information that the body was sending to Yeah. The, and is it sending it to the brain or is it sending it to the energy in the body or something else? So the brain communicating to the nervous system. Mm. Yeah. And then the, the nervous system communi communicating to the brain. So thinking of like your, your, your five senses, sight, taste, I'm going to completely butcher that. <laughs> the five senses um, communicating from, from the body up to the brain. So what we take on in a sensory level. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So let's say your friend then took this uh, pain from his body, this blood from his body. He's telling himself, I I'm just trying to comprehend, like, is there something that we can do in the moment to um, overcome what the body might be telling us? Is it something we can become aware of or is it something that we can't, that we have no control over? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll kind of cycle back to your, your first question here. Um, so, you know, a, a, a healthy nervous system is an adaptable nervous system. I think that people misunderstand and think that a nervous system that's regulated is a nervous system that never goes into fight or flight response, never goes into freeze mm -hmm. response. Mm -hmm. We're always happy. Mm -hmm. The truth of it is that, you know, we need that fight response. We need that flight response. We need the freeze response because they're the things that keep us safe. They're the things that, you know, when someone cuts us off in traffic, there it's, it's, that part of the nervous system that has us slam the foot on the brake, you know, yeah. to, to avoid hitting the person in front of us. So we need that response. Um, however, we don't want that response to be overactive so that when we're in a non-life-threatening circumstance, we're not able to regulate through that. Mm -hmm. So the work that I do with my clients is looking at uh, three different levels. So the deepest level is the nervous system, and that is learning, first of all, mapping out how our unique nervous system works and processes the world so looking at okay when i go into freeze response um for me that looks like it, it's almost a a feeling of lightheadedness i feel okay. nauseous mm -hmm. uh, i can feel somewhat disconnected from my body and so i know that for me personally in those moments i need to focus on grounding so i use approaches like you know uh putting um consciously tensing through my feet and through my legs and trying to bring energy up into the body. Mm. Um, for, for me, I know that when I go into a fight or flight response, I, my temperature rises. I can start to feel that my cheeks get, you know, get warm. I can feel that there's um, like a really strong energy current through my chest. That's what I, I can, feel. Yeah. yeah. And so recognizing that when I feel those feelings, I, I can, I'm able to go, okay, I'm entering a sympathetic nervous system response. So I'm entering fight or flight and I have a list of tools that I can go to, to regulate out of that. Mm. So coming back to my example of my friend in the martial arts competition, for him in that moment, rather than trying to focus on positive thoughts, it would be a matter of, okay, let's go back to our tools and nervous system regulation tools and use them to bring me back to a state of safety. So that could look like breathing techniques. Okay. It could like could look like grounding techniques. And obviously that's a little bit more difficult in a combat sense, you know, in, mm -hmm. when you're in live combat. Um, but yeah, looking at regulating through the body rather than through the mind. Is that something you teach your clients to do then if they find themselves in this mode? Okay. Yeah. That's yeah, really yeah, interesting. Definitely. I've never heard of that before. Yeah. So, so does, is this kind of in line with what Dr. Joe Dispenza teaches or anything like that? I think he gets into what neuroplasticity and epigenetics yeah. and all of that. Yeah. There would to, to be honest, I'm not really well versed in Dispenza's work, but I would okay. say I, I know enough of it to say that there would be tie-ins, I would think. I'm so fascinated by all of that. He's got a couple of books yeah. out and I've been meaning to read them, but, uh, and one of these days I will. So tell me a little bit more than we, we, you know, today we wanted to talk a little bit about being authentically you and working through this trauma so that, you know, you can free yourself to be more authentically you. Um, what, you know, how, well, how much time does it typically take for you to work with somebody to get them to the point where they can feel like, Ah, this is who I am. I've, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've gotten down to, you know, got, I've gotten past all the social masks and all the, the layers and the people pleasing and the hiding who I am and suppressing this and suppressing that. How long does a process like that typically take? Um, I'm going to answer that in a, in a kind of slightly left to field way. Okay. Uh, my belief is that it's the work is never done. 
you know I, I mean I've been doing this work for for almost 11 years now and I still find like just yesterday I had something pop up where I was like oh my god you know noticing noticing the dysregulation in my body and and in that moment while I'm right in the heat of this situation trying to regulate through it to show up authentically so I think that it it, it is an ongoing process and it's a constant unraveling process um but I like to think of that as a really empowering, um, you know, ongoing opportunity to continue to grow. I think sometimes people hear that and go, oh, my God, it's pointless. You know, right. I'm never going to get there. Yeah. But I, I actually think that's really beautiful that we get to continually meet new levels of ourselves and new parts of ourselves. All right. So I'm curious then what this what this process is for you, because for me, um, and I've never gone through your coaching program, so I can't speak to that. But what I can speak to is my constant journey and my constant process. And one of those for me is boundaries. Mm. That is my opportunity to continuously um, challenge myself to be authentically myself. Mm -hmm. And that'll come up almost daily. It could be a minor boundary being crossed or a situation where I have... I'm fighting against what I like to call social norms, which especially for us women tend to uh, hold us back in expressing ourselves because we're supposed to be the nice girl or, you know, we don't want to make this other person feel uncomfortable. We need to take care of their feelings because that's how we've been raised and taught and conditioned to, to be and do. But when we do that, it really uh, doesn't allow us to be our authentic selves, I found. And so for me, every time I stand up for a boundary and express like, hey, I'm feeling uncomfortable right now or, you know, I don't like that or that's, you know, speaking up for myself, it always feels very empowering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And is that part of is, is that similar for you or what do you find are your more constant challenges yeah i mean boundaries is a huge one um i i, I wholeheartedly agree i think that we live in a world where um generally speaking you know um i mean most most people operate from people pleaser mm -hmm. you know most people operate from this place of putting others before themselves and and kind of losing themselves in you know consistently um, consistently trying to support others at the expense of themselves, you know? I and feel it, like this is super important for us to highlight because I think a lot of people don't realize that it isn't just them, that this, mm -hmm. you see women, you work with women on a regular basis. This is what you do. Mm -hmm. And you see that this is consistent across what, how, what percentage of the females that you work with, would you say this is an issue with? A hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. So. Yeah. You're not alone, unfortunately. Mm. This is a yeah. problem. And this is the reason why it's so persistent because we learn from the other women around us, whether it's our mothers, our grandmothers, our peers, our teachers, our church leaders, whomever. And if 100% of the women behaving this way, this is what we're being modeled. And so no wonder why we have mm. this as a persistent problem. So I think that's an important note to make is, you know, if we're going to uh, make change we're going to have to be the change despite what we see around us, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and this is the thing, uh, you know, it, and it feeds back into the nervous system work that we've spoken about and, and you know, the, the trauma stuff underlying. So many women are brought up in, well, I'm going to say so many pe people, you know, mm -hmm. are brought up in situations where, um, they're almost gaslighted out of their boundaries, you know, or they're not modelled that as children, you know, they, they don't witness healthy dynamics within their caregivers or their parents. And so they don't know what it is to uphold healthy boundaries. And right. so, first of all, they haven't, you know, most people, when I first start working with a lot of women, I say the term boundaries and they have no idea what that even means. Right. right? Yeah. And so um, it's first of all recognising that uh First of all, coming to understand what our boundaries are, what we will and won't accept, what does and doesn't feel good for us, and that is an evolving process in and of itself. Um, and then also learning how to feel safe enough within ourselves to voice that. Right. You know, as I said, a lot of people are brought up in circumstances where when they do voice a boundary, someone will sort of question it and pick it and tell them that it's wrong. And, you know, and then it has us go, oh, 
Am I overreacting? Mm -hmm. Am I overthinking this? Am I being silly? Am I being too sensitive? Am I being too much of this or too much of that? And it causes you to question yourself, question your own feelings, Mm -hmm. if they're even valid or not. Exactly. And and it starts when we're very young. Yes. Yes. And that is the problem. Mm. Yeah. I don't think that's discussed enough. And, uh, And then we have to, as adults now, learn who are we what what do we feel mm-hmm. you know sometimes we've suppressed it for so long we even we haven't ever ever given it a voice or any validity within our souls within our body and allowed it to work its way through we don't even know what it feels like because we don't mm-hmm. accept it that self rejection is just so pervasive and so that is why as i me personally as i work through my boundaries and get to know what they are Um, and honor them and trust them and stand up for them and fearlessly like a warrior just say, no, you know, this is not okay. Or, Hey, this is how I feel. And it feels so good. And -hmm. guess what? In the end, what I have found has happened is it hasn't pushed anyone away. As a matter Mm -hmm. of fact, it draws people closer because they realize that, Oh, you know, they can, they get to see who you really are. Mm -hmm. understand where your boundaries are so it actually it creates a more healthy relationship for you and everyone else and um and and when you're in your power it's so much more attractive to be around somebody who is in their power no yeah absolutely absolutely and i love that you voice there that for you when you when you do uphold a boundary it's it feels empowering, you know, you've, you've yeah. built that muscle, mm-hmm. um, you've built up that, that muscle memory of, oh, okay, this is something that gets to feel really good for me. Yeah. And so few women are connected to that. And so for many women, when they do set a boundary, especially mothers, yeah. when they do first start practicing setting boundaries, the guilt pops up, the yes. shame, the questioning, the, oh my God, you know, all of these stories and, and, and feelings of, um, you know, that they've done something wrong. Yes. And that's that nervous system regulation piece where we have to start to create the safety within our body and the level of trust within ourselves that we can stand firmly in our boundaries, even in the moments where we feel guilt, even in the the moments where we feel shame. Yes. Brianna, you Mm. just touched on something really, really important. That Mm. guilt, Mm. that guilt I don't think gets talked enough about. But Mm -hmm. that guilt is what we let dictate our behaviors. Mm -hmm. It rules us. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on guilt? Is guilt, is guilt something that we should be giving attention, like heeding and, and giving power to, or what, what is guilt? Mm. Guilt is, um, and I'm going to come at this from more of a top down perspective. So looking at uh, more of the cognitive side of things, but guilt in my opinion is it's a half it's a incomplete perception of something so if i'm feeling guilt for upholding a boundary what i'm what i'm seeing is that it's only going to be a drawback for the per, for the other person involved that they're only going to receive um negative results as a result of my boundary mm-hmm. or as a result of whatever the circumstance you're is. worried about them so the guilt is about them yes you're feeling guilty yep. about the fact that what you need to take care of their feelings mm-hmm. is that yeah. what that is yeah and so what we're overlooking in that moment is the other side of the equation and that is how it's actually of benefit to them mm-hmm. how it's actually of service to them and and this can be quite um quite warping for some people to get their head around at first but you know we we get to look at the other side of the equation and me setting this boundary how is this actually of service to not only this person but to me and to the strengthening of our relationship because as you said when we set boundaries um it's it's actually creating a safe container for the relationship it's setting it's setting um you know, it's it's letting us know here's the parameters through which I'm able to to love you and love myself at the same time. Oh, that's so good. I love yeah. that. Here are the parameters of which I'm able to love myself and you at the same time. Mm-hmm. And who has to set those boundaries? You do. They mm-hmm. do. We all do, right? We all yeah. have to set the boundaries for what we will stand for and what we won't stand for, what's okay for us and what's not okay for us. It's our job, though, to do that. So when we come up against that guilt, 
what though I, i'd love to know i don't know if you know the science behind it or what is that uh, that feeling right we get this feeling like it's like a ping it's like a oh god and i've heard before um somebody else another um uh doctor, she, uh, she's a psychologist or a, uh, maybe a family therapist, but she said to me once that uh, guilt is actually not uh, that you're doing something wrong. It's that you're going against a preconditioned program that you're used to running. And so you're, you're either about to break it or whatever, and it feels uncomfortable because it's just a condition that you're used to running in. Yeah. Is, does that ring true for you? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, as you said, it's just coming up against that old conditioning of this is who I need to be. Mm -hmm. Think of it like this. As, as children, we are, um, we're conditioned through our upbringing that this is who I need to be in order for me to be safe. This is who I need to be in order for me to be accepted. This is who I need to be. Yeah, yeah, to be, you know, to be um, celebrated and encouraged mm -hmm. and supported. And if I am this person, then I am reprimanded or I am um, yelled at or I am, you know, hit or whatever it may be. I am unsafe. I am under threat. Yeah. And so when we come up against feelings like guilt um, or any quote unquote negative emotion, it's just a feedback mechanism to let us know that we're trying something different on, that we're doing something outside of what we've been made to believe is who we need to be in order for us to be loved and accepted. I think that's so powerful for everyone to kind of absorb that information because I believe most of us women let guilt run it, run our lives. Mm -hmm. Mom guilt is a real thing. And I've talked to a lot of men about this and it doesn't seem that most men have guilt. Even the most empathetic men that I've met still say they don't relate to guilt. So it's this strange thing that we have as women that is just embedded into our DNA or something, because I don't yeah. think I know a single woman who doesn't have guilt, unless perhaps she's psych uh, pathological or something like that. Uh, but um, what, what are the types of people who don't have guilt? It's the, uh, it's not pathological, a sociopath, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so unless you're a sociopath, I think we all have guilt. And, mm. and that's something I think really needs, there needs to be more attention brought to this because we let that guilt run our lives to our own detriment, yeah. usually. Now, yeah. sometimes I found once I, once this, the, I became aware of this, I, you know, every time guilt does come up, I examine it now. I become conscious of it. Yes. Most of the time I found it is that I'm running against this old conditioning that I'm challenging. However, there are occasions where it does come up where it's like uh, I'm coming up against maybe a moral issue or a mor something moral that I, I want to uphold. Mm -hmm. There are occasion where there are occasions where guilt does have is justified in giving it consideration. Like, oh, am mm -hmm. I doing the right thing here? Should I consider the needs of this other person? There are there are times when it it is you know legitimate to give it some a spotlight or a little bit of yeah. focus or some attention. But I feel like we need to be conscious of it because most of the time it's not it's not justified. Yeah. Yeah. I love what you said there that you examine it. You know, I think we are brought up in a society where any feeling, it's like push that aside, sweep it under the rug. You know, if it's a negative emotion, we don't want to look at that. Mm -hmm. And we're actually missing out on so much gold and such huge opportunities to grow and evolve as individuals by sweeping our emotions under the rug. You know, as, as you've said, in those moments where you feel guilt, you take that as an opportunity to look at where it's actually stemming from and whether that is stemming from, you know, your moral compass or co compass or whether it's mm -hmm. coming from, you know, pushing up against that old conditioning. Either way, it's an opportunity for you to get to know yourself on a deeper level and, um, you know, choose something that's empowering, whether it's, okay, this is this guilt is valid and this is something to do with, you know, my moral compass, in which case, beautiful, you know, what a, what a beautiful opportunity for you to anchor further into that. Right. Or is it something that's just stemming from that old conditioning, in which case, amazing, like, I, you know, I get to learn something new about myself and challenge myself to grow beyond that. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm such a stand for using our emotions as an opportunity to, to get to know ourselves even more deeply. 
I love that. You know, I'm all about journaling in the morning, uh, wherever you can find the time, but I have a morning journaling routine. Gosh, I can't talk today. A morning <laughs> journaling routine that I absolutely love. It's just, it became a habit of mine. Even if I can only squeeze in 15 minutes or so, that connection time is really important. It gets, allows me to get to know myself better, to, to contemplate these things that maybe happened the day before that I need to give some space to and mm. just really just feel it out. And mm. I find that journaling it through really helps me work it through and kind of figure things out so they don't get either shoved aside or, or bottled up or whatever. And so it's also a great way to get to know yourself better because uh, I don't know about you, but I feel like it's really important to uh, spend time with yourself and get to know yourself mm. better and build that relationship with yourself. It's the most important relationship we have. So, mm. yeah, absolutely. And I'd I'd love to go one deeper than that. You know, the, like the journey journaling practice is incredible for self awareness, and you know, it also it it can bring up those feelings, and we can start to gain more of a an understanding of of what we are feeling. But one level deeper than that, I really encourage people to um, invite the feelings that they're feeling in. You know, as I said, we push them out and we we try to ignore them. Yeah. They're actually friends. You know, they're mm. actually they're. I, I I use the analogy. You know, invite them in for dinner, sit down and have a chat with them, and see what they're actually there to teach you. Mm. You know, when we we'll go with guilt as the example when it pops up we go oh I don't want to feel that fix it fix it fix it you know get me out of this feeling of guilt rather than actually sitting with it and uh, the really beautiful thing is when we just sit with our emotions and when I say sit with with our emotions I mean close your eyes and actually feel what it feels like in your body you know feel the temperature feel the texture feel where it's sitting in your body whether it's got jagged edges or whether it's you know like a round ball or whether it's moving and and once we learn to sit with our emotions, most emotions pass through the body within maximum 10 minutes, mm. you know. And so we're here trying to avoid feeling it when if we just chose to, to sit with it instead, it will have passed within 10 minutes. And that builds our capacity because we're able to then realise that that feeling of guilt, I didn't die from it. Yeah. I wasn't under any serious, you know, threat to my safety. Um, and I've actually come out of it with this deeper understanding of myself. Yeah. And so, yeah, rather than pushing them under the rug and, and avoiding, when we feel our capacity to create what we want to create in our lives and to fully express ourselves grows in leaps and bounds because we're no longer avoiding feeling these feelings. They just become a part of the process. Oh, my gosh. You just gave me chills. That was beautiful, Brianna. You're absolutely you. right. We do need to feel our feelings. It's so important and we spend so much time pushing them aside medicating self-medicating with alcohol or whatever or just avoiding 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 but when we can let them run their course they run mm -hmm. through us and they just they they dissipate right and we mm -hmm. also get to know ourselves better understand our emotions better so what do you think should we let our emotions guide our behavior or what are your thoughts on that yeah I, I think that comes back to, and I, I'm, I'm aware I, I keep cycling back to this, but it's such a potent point, the nervous system regulation stuff. So when, for example, anger, when, we're, when we experience anger, society tells us that anger is a destructive emotion bad. that, you know, yes. yeah, it's bad. If you're an angry person, you know, you, you need fixing, you're broken. And, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we're, we're very much taught to... Um, bottle up anger mm -hmm. and so what happens is when an em en uh, emotion is energy in motion so emotion wants to flow through us wait a second i hope you don't mind i want to slow that down for a second and let's contemplate that emotion is energy in motion yes that's so cool i love yeah. that okay yes. so okay. our emotions yeah. just want to they just want to move through us that's yeah. it they just want to come up they want to they want to be felt and then they move through us mm. what we do and particularly anger because it has such a bad reputation we push it down mm -hmm. and then we start to have things like heart attacks or bowel cancers or you know these these things that these diseases pop up within the body because that energy of anger has nowhere to go and okay. so it has and to turn inward 
I love what you just said, this dis-ease, and I like how you enunciated that. And and I want to I want to bring that up for anyone who ca- didn't didn't catch that or who missed that. Dis-ease, and that is what dis disease is, right? Is mm. a dis-ease. It's not being easy what with our emotions it's like uh what would you how would you explain that yeah well it's a it's a feeling of unease that hasn't been processed Mm -hmm. and so you know for in many circumstances um you know and this this is really opening up a can of worms but in most cases most you you know most sicknesses most illnesses are just unprocessed emotions i've heard this and so yeah and so when we start to learn how to fully feel our emotions they're, they're no longer trapped within the body. They're no longer um, stagnant in the body and sort of mm-hmm. festering in the body. They, they, they move, you know, they move through us effortlessly. So I talk about this in my book about moving this energy through you because, for example, energy like shame, um, like shame, it just gets stuck in there. It's this like stuck emotion that just never works its way through usually it just stays there and then it starts to define your life and you get triggered somehow by something and then you relive that emotion over and over and over again until you clear it through you're just going to keep finding situations that come to you as reasons to oh it triggers that emotion now you keep recreating that story you create an identity almost out of this emotion right? Mm -hmm. And then it becomes just a part of you. It's this stuck, Mm -hmm. stuck energy, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so so you want to move that through is what I've learned. Get that energy moved through. So it's no longer stuck in your energy field, that it's not creating Mm dis-ease and that uh, it can just run its course because that's all it really wants to do is run its course, right? Yeah. I always use the analogy, you know, think of your body as, as, as almost like a, a pipe. And when we keep pushing down whatever our experience is, eventually that pipe has to overflow and whatever it's full of is what's going to come out, right? So if we have a bunch of shame and anger and guilt and sadness that we've just keep, you know, that we keep pushing down, eventually that's going to just spew out of, you know, the top of this pipe. And so it's about learning how to feel your emotions in a regulated way. So if we come back to the anger example, dysregulated anger would be this like explosive reaction. Right. Whereas um, regulated anger is where we consciously choose to go and feel our anger in a time and space where it's not destructive. I've heard of people, I've seen some posts, I think it's on the holistic psychologist um uh, Instagram page. Yes. I, I, there was a post where she was out with one of her clients or something screaming out in the woods, Mm -hmm. just letting whatever this was out. Mm -hmm. And it seemed very healthy. And I think that's what that was part of is just letting this energy run its course, like letting Mm -hmm. it run through you, not hiding from it, but just letting it run through is, is, is that what would be like how you, what you would, I can't talk today. Is that what you would consider to be like a healthy processing of that emotion? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think of the body as a, it's, it's a living library of every experience we've ever had. And so, you know, if, if you've, if you've had all of these dark, heavy experiences, these deeply emotional experiences, um, they're, they're like books that you've put on the shelf and you're carrying that with you everywhere you go. And so it's learning how to um, not only kind of rewrite the endings of those books so that you can come to see those experiences as being something that's uh, happened for you rather than to you, but also, um, yeah, be, being able to kind of pick and choose what what books you keep in the library in terms of your emotional experiences. And so, yeah, for anger, I really recommend, and this, this can be quite triggering for some people, but as you said, you know, the I call them the primal scream. Go out somewhere where you can, you know, yell a swear word at the top of your lungs. Go out to, you know, a, um, out into the country, a paddock or the woods or, you know, somewhere secluded where you can just have a good yell, you know. <laughs> or um, I often use, and it sounds really bizarre, but, um, you know, I get like a pillow or like a bean bag or even, you know, a boxing bag and I'll get a bat and I will just like, hit you know hit the crap out of the uh, out of the bag or the pillow until um until there's it's sort of you know it clears the channel and you feel it instantly it's like this sudden release Mm. and it's it's like um 
you know when the hose gets kinked and it mm-hmm. stops the flow mm-hmm. it's like it's like ironing out that kink nice. and all of a sudden you know the the flow is back and the the feeling is incredible the difference is incredible I think that's such great information because I think a lot of people, myself included once upon a time, would think that any expression of any of these perceived negative emotions would just be bad. This would be bad. I'm shaming myself almost. I was shaming myself almost for having the emotion, like I shouldn't even have it. And so you Mm -hmm. squelch it. But it really, it's really good to know that it's healthy to just Mm -hmm. cuss it out, get it out, you know? Yeah scream, whatever yeah. you got to do, not at somebody else. Don't take it out on them. But like, but what, what, that is a good question though. What if you're feeling angry at somebody else? You know, it's one thing to feel something on your own, but what if you are in front of somebody and a, a negative emotion comes up? What is a healthy way in your opinion to handle that? Yeah. Well, I mean, the more you consciously choose to feel it in circumstances where it's safe, the more you'll be able to recognize it and regulate through it in times where, you know, when when you're in the moment. So if you're in a circumstance where maybe you're having a disagreement with someone, um, you're able to, in that moment, recognize the feeling in the body long before it becomes something that you're no longer able to control. So in that moment, you're able to respond from a place of, you know, maybe saying, hey, I'm, you know, this is starting to trigger some stuff for me. Do you mind if we take some space for 20 minutes and then come back to this conversation? So good. I I talk about this a lot, responding versus reacting. And that is a very good example of that. In that moment, you need to process that emotion and not react because that would just be letting your emotions run wild and and just reacting. That's not who you are though. Who you are is the more conscious decision-maker behind that and the responder versus the reactor and to be able to come up with a proper response that is who you are authentic to you not based on this emotion then you're absolutely right i find that taking just even if it might be a couple seconds a little Mm. pause if you feel like you have processed it enough or just say you know what hey i i need a little time right now and i'll Let's get back together when I've calmed down a bit or, or, or whatever. And that might be a day, a couple of hours, whatever it is. But um, until you can respond, I found that it is much better to not react mm. at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's just building that um, the the emotional body that's able to recognize what's coming up. And, and as you said, respond rather than react reaction is a sign that the body is in that survival mode you know we're operating from our animal instincts um whereas when we're responding we're when we're able to you know logically communicate and and think through what's going on that's when you know we're we're in a more of a conscious state we're not operating from that survival mechanism Mm, so good brianna oh my gosh thank you so much for coming on today and sharing such wise words of wisdom if if somebody wanted to get in touch with you what is the best way that they can do it is it through your instagram your website all that good stuff which i'll be sharing with everyone as well uh details on the in the show notes but maybe you can tell us the the best way to get in touch with you yeah so instagram is probably the the best way so brianna bowley b-r-i-a-n-a b-o-w-l-e-y i do also have a free resource for women uh mm-hmm. it's called fierce and free so it's supporting women in setting boundaries Um, and also learning how to create enough space in their world that they can start to respond rather than react. So they can get that at www.fiercefreewoman.com. And that's a free resource? Yes. Love it. Oh, thank you so much for sharing. Well, it's such a pleasure having you on today. Thank you so much, Brianna. I appreciate it. No, thank you. I've loved this chat. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you liked the show, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button now. I have so much more to share with you in the future. If we're not already connected on social media, I would love, love, love to connect with you there. You'll find me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. 
at Jenna Banks.0. You'll find me on LinkedIn. Just type in my name, Jenna Banks. But also don't forget to sign up for my newsletter at my website, which is Jenna-Banks.com. I will be sharing all kinds of wonderful details with you. I only send out a newsletter about once a month, maybe twice a month at the most. So I won't spam you, but I've got a book coming out in March of 2022 on International Women's Day. Yes, that is the launch for my book, which is titled I Love Me More, How to Find Happiness and Success Through Self-Love. And I can't wait to share this book with you. I know it's going to help so many women. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I hope to see you next time. And remember, your love is your power. Until next time.